Welcome to the Legal Academy bonus edition. This is a different kind of episode of the Legal Academy, not something we had planned, uh, but I'm here. This is Oren Kerr. I'm here with Andrew Crespo, professor of law at Harvard Law School. And we were uh, exchanging thoughts on a new Supreme Court case uh, on Twitter. And we decided let's just do this as an episode of the show. So Andrew, I'm really glad you could join me as we talk through Torres versus Madrid. Of course, thanks for having me. I think awesome. I suggested we do this on Clubhouse, but then forgot you have like your own whole production studio here and uh, and podcast. So I'm just glad to get to come on and talk to you. Awesome. Yeah, I went on Clubhouse. Didn't I didn't like it. So let's just stick with the podcast. So so this is a, a case, new case, Torres versus Madrid on the scope of seizures under the Fourth Amendment. It was handed down yesterday, a 5-3 decision by Chief Justice Roberts with Justice Gorsuch dissenting. And the question in the case is, what does it mean to seize, seize a person when there's an application of force. So in particular, does touching a person either directly or through some uh, remote uh, item, through some tool, um, amount to a seizure of the person? Uh, or does seizing a person always require taking physical control and bringing the person into the government's control? Uh, the, the facts of the case involved a woman who was um, shot while driving away from the police. The police were shooting at the car in order to try to stop the car, um, but she did not stop after she was being shot. She continued on, later files a civil suit for excessive force under the Fourth Amendment, saying that she was unconstitution unconstitutionally seized. And the question was whether a seizure had occurred, uh, which had gone back to some dicta in Hodari D, a 1991 case, which suggested without really establishing, but that was an open question in the case, of there might be a different definition of seizures of a person than of seizures of other things. And, and that was the issue uh, uh, in, in Torres versus Madrid, whether, whether uh, uh, Torres was in fact seized. So uh, the court holds that Torres was seized, that there's this um, uh, separate rule for seizures that involve physical force of a person. Uh, and that is that as long as there's a touching, uh, uh, some sort of application of physical force to the body with intent to restrain, that's a seizure of the person. And, and Andrew, what do you think? What are your reactions to the case? You know, my initial reaction was uh, that I, I remember when they took this case uh, and I, you know, I, it was, I think, you know, pandemic memory is, 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 is fuzzy, but I think it was close to when I was teaching Hodari D uh, in Crim Pro. And my first reaction when I saw this case was, was, was granted was, I thought we answered this already. I thought Hodari D just resolved this, you know? Uh, and, you know, I think you and I might have maybe, I think we read it roughly the same way. You know, you say suggested that it resolved it, but I, you know, I, I sort of take the chief justice in this case at, as, as, as right when he says we largely covered this ground in Hodari D. You know, Hodari D, I think, um, I think Hodari D to my reading answered this question in the way that non-lawyers would say answered this question, which is to say, Hodari D has language that just says exactly what this case says, right? You know, merely touching someone with intent to restrain them is a seizure. It's lawyers who would say maybe it didn't quite resolve it because that case didn't involve physical touching, right? So there's then this little bit of a shadow fight, I think, between Justice Gorsuch and the chief here about whether Hodari D was dicta or not. But regardless of whether it was or not, I just sort of assumed that Hodari D, whether you call it a holding or dicta, was sort of that considered dicta, high on the ladder of dicta, you know, and had and had resolved this. So I was initially sort of surprised uh, to to know that it had produced this disagreement and that the court had to come back in again. But then once they granted it, I sort of just assumed this was one of those, you know, cleanup duty, like you know, like a circuit split on aisle four kind of cases where the court is just coming in to tell everybody we said this in Hodari D. And the majority opinion, as I read it, effectively, effectively does say that. They do say we resolved this in Hodari D, but it was 5-3, uh, whereas Hodari D was, you know, uh, a, on this issue, effectively a unanimous opinion written by Justice Scalia. So to see it now come around as a 5-3 opinion was something that was a little, uh, I didn't expect that, uh, especially when the, the, the SG was on, was on the, the, was not on law enforcement side here, which is incredibly rare for the United States in criminal type cases. Yeah, it's interesting. My reaction was different actually. When I, when I first heard that the cert was granted, I thought, well, of course the 10th circuit is right. Uh, there's no acquisition of control and that's what a seizure is. And yeah, maybe there's some quirky common law cases that involve radically different contexts, but none of them involved any sort of modern seizure. And there's this whole concept of what a seizure is, 
which is a seizure is a taking of control. It's really consistent with seizing a thing, take, removing that thing away and arresting a person through a show of authority. And I thought, oh, well that, and that's, and then it's like, oh, there's this, there's this page or so that talks about some common law rule in Hodari D. They suggested it might be different. And I was like, well, this is interesting. And I don't know what to make of that. And, and maybe it's, maybe it's like, I just never focused on the full Hodari D opinion versus focusing on all the other seizure cases. But it does seem like this was a weird situation where you, you'd had sort of a whole development of the concept of seizures that ignored this. And then you have Hodari D that focused on this. And then it's like, well, what do you do? Do you do kind of the conceptual answer or the um, uh, or the or 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 that historical answer? And and just in in looking at the opinions, I'm struck by the fact that the court doesn't talk about or almost completely ignores what must have been on the minds of at least the sort of left of center justices, which is the the way that this matters is for excessive force cases, right? It almost never is going to matter for a suppression remedy case. So. This is, it seems like it's something that would only come up in the context of, can you file a civil suit for excessive force against an officer who did X to you? And I totally get the court's ruling from the standpoint of why you would want to have a seizure include the touching without making the person stop. Because like, if, if the police shoot me, who cares whether I stop or I manage to continue? Like that should be irrelevant to whether I should be able to sue the officers. But, but it's fascinating, it, it, Justice Gorsuch makes this like an accusation of the majority, like I think you're actually being foot driven by this practical concern. And then Chief Justice Roberts says, no, 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 I have no idea why you're thinking of that. And I was, it, I think there's, that's interesting on a lot of levels. One yeah. is that there's, you know, just the question of, is there a subtext that is really motivating the justices here that they're not talking about, which I think is often the case, but also that there was no express acknowledgement of that as a valid concern. And that, I don't know, I mean, is that just to keep Kavanaugh on board? This is a 5-3 case involving mm -hmm. the three liberal left of center justices and then chief, the chief writes it and Kavanaugh is, is maybe our, our fifth vote. You wanna keep him on board or it, I, I guess it, it wouldn't. It wouldn't have occurred to me that this was like an illegitimate basis for consideration because it's probably what's driving a lot of this. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I So I, we're obviously, you know, <laughs> as is always the case in these things, like speculating about the what happened behind the, the curtain. Was it strategic? Was it accidental? You know, I, I imagine this opinion looks very different. It looks more like the opinion you're describing if it ends up being that Sotomayor is writing for the five of them and Alito's writing the dissent, right? Because, you know, I think both of them would be thinking, first of all, I don't think of either of them as particularly, in you know, invested in the like common law as method as much as maybe Justice Gorsuch was. But also, you know, I think that they would be asking exactly your questions, which are the practical ones. Um, what's uh, kind of, I, I would love to get into this a bit more because it's possible in my mind, in my mind, I think it's possible that there actually are suppression implications of this that are surprising. And that uh, it's the, to me, the, the, the strangest part of the opinion uh, that it seems to me that this case potentially expands Hodari D or goes beyond Hodari D insofar as, and by the way, I bring that up in this context because if this case had been orbiting around the practicalities, you'd imagine they would have gotten to this point that sort of jumps out at me, but because it was all common law, common law, they potentially, you know, got to a weird place in the practicalities because the practicalities aren't being talked about. The, the weird place to me is this, my guess, my assumption after Hodari D was that a mere touch with intent to restrain, right? So what does that look like? A police officer walks up to you and says, uh, hey, uh, I have some questions for you. And when he says, hey, you know, puts his hand on your shoulder, right? Hey, I have some questions for you. My understanding under Hodari D is that's a seizure, you're seized, he needs a basis to do that. But my understanding was also that that is now a Terry stop. Right. And he needs reasonable suspicion to have done that. Mm -hmm. But the common law thing of this, I mean, there's many paragraphs of this opinion on both sides, the majority and the dissent that say, no, this is an arrest when he says, hey, I want to talk to you. Uh, right. Like the whole like there's just whole sentences of it where he says, you know, the chief is saying this is an arrest, uh, which would potentially have some maybe significant implication for suppression if all of these things that before would have been very, very, you know, a whole bunch of stuff in the Terry world 
is potentially, maybe accidentally, unintentionally, but explicitly now, I think, in the arrest world. Uh, maybe another way to put that is, I think that there are many defense lawyers who will read this and see the equation to arrest and say, these are now arrests. So I just think, I think that there's a potential set of suppression consequences that are um, potentially come out of this, which is weird because it's so clear that excessive force is what's driving the opinion, right? You've got like two very different ways that this physical touching matters. It matters for the constitutional tort of excessive force under the Fourth Amendment, but then it also potentially matters for the law of arrest. And they just seem to not be talking about the latter at all, in part because they're not talking about the practicalities or you know the ways this intersects with doctrine. So anyway, I, I thought that was kind of kind of interesting. And I just imagined in my head, like I kept wondering reading it, what is Justice Alito? Is, is he thinking about this point? Like, you know, that they were maybe rewriting the law of arrest. And if he were dissenting, I sort of imagine he would have maybe thrown that in there. Yeah, I've I've not thought about this, although it's a really interesting angle. Maybe so maybe the idea would be that if you incorporate the common law more. You know, the common law didn't have a Terry stop category. Right. Um, and so so it was all sort of arrest or nothing. And so maybe the maybe the idea would be like the, you're an officer making a Terry stop and you say, hey, stay over there. And you can do that because that's a, um, a, a show of authority seizure. And that's Terry. And then maybe if you just tap them, that that would be actually you need probable cause to touch them because then it becomes a seizure by application of physical force instead. Instead Which of, of course a, gets extra strange, right? Because Terry is not just about stops, but frisks and you're touching someone when you frisk them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now, maybe you're not touching them with the intent to restrain them because they're already restrained. You're touching them with the intent to do what Terry says, which is to you know protect yourself. So, I mean, honestly, my, 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 this is just a long way of saying that I just sort of have this sense that if Sotomayor and Alito were writing these, that somewhere there would have been some sort of footnote that at least acknowledges like what you just said, right? Like Terry didn't exist at the common law we are not deciding, you know, this thing or, or just addressing it instead right. of like multiple paragraphs that basically say, no, it's an arrest. You know, I guess what I'm saying is arrest is a term of art in 2021. Right. So not the same as the term of art it was at the common law, but they don't, they seem to go back and forth here. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting point I had not thought of. And it, it is, it, so, so I want to, this actually brings up my, my next sort of thought with, or, or issue to talk about. The majority opinion is very much based on the syllogism of an arrest was a seizure. So we looked at what was a common law arrest, and then that must be a seizure. And, and this does, it, it's pages and pages and pages of 18th century cases and what is the context of this? And then Justice Gorsuch, you know, many, many pages sort of go, take, saying, disagreeing with the reading of the common law and saying, the majority is picking and choosing its common law, and here's the better interpretation of the common law. So one one lesson for that is um, for criminal procedure scholars, you know, pull out your Hale and pull out your Hawkins and pull out your Blackstone and start reading the common law because maybe just that's what criminal procedure is going to become um, or has become. Uh, and and I think uh, uh, the, the oral argument earlier this week in another Fourth Amendment case also had a lot of common law discussions in it. And um, maybe we're just, is, is that the world we're in? And if so, is that, I mean, is there, what, what does that mean for the law of criminal procedure? And, and I guess maybe that's really kind of asking the legal realist question of, do we think the common law is really doing work here? Or is there just enough wiggle room that they're gonna go where they wanna go and just phrase it as a common law? Question? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, I think it's a great question. I mean, like, yeah, you end up with these, you know, the, the, the Countess of Rutland and, you know, you, you, could, you get a sense that some of the justices just are having some fun with it, right? Like the one footnote in the chief's opinion is him just sort of talking about this, this countess and how, you know, the third count of Rutland, you know, his, his wife stole the jewels. And like, so they, they seem to kind of, there's, there's an enjoyment, I think, of the common law thing. But I think to your um, question, I honestly think the answer changes. Again, this goes a bit to what I was saying a second ago about who's authoring the opinion. I think that for some of the justices, it really is you know, uh, driving it, right? Um, and so sometimes you'll, so there's this almost um, potentially a, a jerkiness to the doctrine, right? Because opinions get assigned based on all sorts of things, right? You know, what cases happen to be argued in the same month and the chief trying to keep everything even. And I get the sense that among these six conservative justices, some of them care more 
about the common law as a as a method and wanting to like kind of you know do the however many pages Justice Gorsuch did, and others might not care as much, which means that you just have a doctrine that depending on who has the opinion sometimes feels like it's dominated by the common law, sometimes feels like it's maybe gesturing or kind of, you know, doing it with as one input, one sort of, you know, piece of the analysis, sometimes as window dressing, sometimes not talked about at all. But for, to your to your question about what does it do for us, you know, I think of like all of these, you know, I, I remember, I think, I'm trying to think of the, the case where Justice Marshall uh, uh, talks about, um, you know, there's, there's a couple uh, where, he just observes how much our world is different from these common law cases, right? You know, like many of these cases are before the existence of police forces, right? Uh, right? I mean, they're they're from a world in which we're the law of arrest is largely the law of private citizens mm -hmm. arresting each other. This case gets you some of it, right? The chief saying we're dealing with you know shooting people, and we're borrowing common law from before a time when law enforcement regularly carried guns. So there's just really strange and challenging, even for someone who's committed to the common law as the, the North Star, a lot of, you know, Kylo type problems, right? Of like, just what do you do with a principle that moves you now into a world where so much has changed and you've got not just police departments, but police departments with guns uh, and all these other things. This comes up a lot in the cases on like, you know, common law or, or uh, fourth amendment rules that turn on the distinction between felony and misdemeanor or felony and lesser offense. Yeah, like and just the observation that like, when we say felony today, we mean something pretty different than what felony meant back when these things happened. You know, I'm trying to, th I think it's, I think it's the Justice Marshall opinion where he says, it's sort of like, you know, quoting Shakespeare and get thee to a nunnery. And we just, you know, in contemporary ears, don't realize that Shakespeare, when he was saying nunnery was making a joke about a brothel. And that, you know, you can lose a lot of translation when you just go to the common law and for, and don't pay close attention to how much the core of this universe policing has changed since these opinions in the, you know, 1700s or so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it does raise interesting questions for, for scholars, first of all, like, to the extent you want your work to have sort of relevance to the legal community and to the decision makers, you know, uh, if the decision makers, or at least some of them, are really, really focused, maybe exclusively focused on the common law. And I think far beyond where Justice Scalia was as well. I mean, there's obviously there's a lot of um, love of Justice Scalia, which pours through in Torres versus Madrid on both sides. Um, but, you know, Justice Scalia, I always had the sense like he had a project to want to make the common law important and want to make the original public understanding important. But he didn't really necessarily sweat the details, at least in the Fourth Amendment setting. He like make you, oh yeah, this you know, in Jones, this is trespassery done. <laughs> he didn't like, he didn't care. Was it? Why? What are the cases? And and now it seems like we're off in in a kind of a different territory, which is like, let's pull out our old treatises and pull out yeah. all the cases and and you know, really get into it. And so I I kind of wonder, does the scholarship go in that direction in part? And certainly, if you're briefing a Fourth Amendment case. Um, I would imagine, you know, the advice would have to be like, you need to talk about history and really become an expert in history. And the, and the briefs uh, in Torres versus Madrid, I think, were lopsided in that regard, where, you know, the Madrid side brief, I think it ends with kind of a comment of like, well, do we really care what happened 200 years ago? Let's be practical here. And let's, let's follow what makes sense today. And, 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 you know, history is history. And I'm thinking like, that's a really bad, <laughs> bad count your votes, like you yeah. need to get to five. And that's not a helpful thing to say. Um, and so maybe, maybe, I don't know if that's criminal procedure specific, or maybe that's true of like a lot of con yeah, law. You know, everything, I, I, but. I was just going to say, you know, I, I think that what you are describing my sense, you know, from talking to our our colleagues is pa parallels the 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 questions over how does what is the role of originalism in the scholarly field right uh and that's influenced by the fact that you might think gosh you know independent of what scholars them what, what might be the center of gravity among scholars on originalism if that becomes something that seems pretty dominant on the highest court in the enterprise in which scholars are engaged in interpreting you know, a, a large part of scholarship, certainly not all of it, but a large part of legal scholarship is trying to make sense of the social practice of what the judges are doing. And if their practice is common law Fourth Amendment, that's going to, I think, yeah, I think there is a real immediate trickle down there. Um, I think this connects also to the, um, 
you know, the, the composition of the court, by which I mean, you know, it went from a court with four liberal justices to three, which means it's even harder to kind of for, you know, folks who are not on the law enforcement side of a case to pick up votes. And so if you think that Justice Gorsuch is, I guess this is a long way of saying, if Justice Gorsuch is now an even more important vote, and if he is someone who really cares about this, then that means, you know, that kind of gives almost an extra turbo boost into what lawyers have to do. And then in turn, I think, I think you're right that part of the scholarly enterprise has to, you know, engage in that more, um, yeah. unless it all just starts falling apart, right? You know, unless they just realize that they can't, you know, either derive from it the clarity that they're hoping or translate it into, like, that, that you just can't jump the, the centuries divide and that too much has changed. Uh, I guess part of it also depends a bit on the, you know, how often the chief is in the position of assigning these, how invested he is in the, common law thing. And if he's not invested in it, again, I might be wrong thinking that Justice Alito is more, you know, practically oriented on these things. But if he is, you know, maybe he starts getting more of these opinions. And yeah, it, and it may, it may be that Torres versus Madrid is this deeply originalist opinion only because there's Hodari D with Scalia endorsing a view that he says is originalist, which then becomes like, oh, you know, if you're if you're one of the liberal justices, you'd be like, we love Justice Scalia. We're being originalists, aren't you? Um, and so, you know, that that can that can be kind of like, we don't need to make the practical arguments yeah. because we've got this answer, which we think will get five votes, and and it does. Um, and and so it may just be the quirk of that. And I'm thinking I'm thinking Chief Justice Roberts writing Carpenter, where he he says, you know, there's this like. The framers would have wanted a balance between law enforcement and privacy interest. And now let's go. <laughs> so there's, yeah. a, there's a framers kind of originalist little thing and then yeah. off and running in very, I think like non-originalist practical, we need to balance the powers and here's why this is a good rule kind of, kind of territory. And so, you know, m maybe this is just a, a quirky case where it ends up being more originalist or, you know, maybe you say and ultimately, you know, Carpenter was the pre Barrett court uh, yeah. where the number once you get to I mean with three justices expressly endorsing originalism I just got that that's a large number and they they seem to be I would guess they're sort of at least maybe on the current court relatively swing center votes where they're get, gettable at least based on the yeah. small number of cases we have so far you know, one thing that strikes me as somewhat different too you were talking about the difference between kind of Justice Scalia's common law and this common law uh, another thing though that's different about Justice Scalia's is at least his project at the point to which it developed before he passed was, I think, always expressly one directional common law, right? So this was true in Jones, and there's a footnote in Hodari D where he does it too, where he basically says, you know, the common law can expand our understanding of what we might think of is the, you know, a search or seizure under other things, right? You know, like, you know, it's like the, Jones gives you its, you know, it's either reasonable expectations of privacy, uh, you know, or if if common law adds to that, then you, of course, take on the common law. Same thing with Hodari D as this sort of footnote where he says, you know, it might seem strange to think that mere touching is a seizure to common, you know, ears today, but that's what the common law said. So we got to go with it, right? right but right. I think that if you become a kind of um, even more invested in the common law as the exclusive test, right, that it can now start shrinking existing doctrine, then there's more at stake, right, there's for, for the other side, for the liberals. So they now, now need to, you know, it's extra important, I think, to be able to, you know, talk the common law talk and try to win on that terrain. If it's the exclusive terrain, as opposed to for Scalia, it seemed like he, at least at the point in the stage of the project that he was at with Jones, was open to there being, you know, cats and the non-common law thing. And you know, tort trespass property, uh, as opposed to saying I'm ditching the other thing and I'm a, I'm a common law exclusive, you know, I'm, a, I'm, ex I'm an exclusivist about the common law. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. And there was always speculation, where would, where was Justice Scalia going with this? Did he want that's to lock say, the know, other I, part off if he could? But exactly. you know, in that we'll never know. Um, so I think that's, I think that's a great point. So yeah, I, I mean, want to end on a, a doctrinal, uh, some, yeah. some doctrinal issue. So it seems to me that just from a black letter law perspective, 
Torres versus Madrid is like really important for purposes of teaching your standard investigatory criminal procedure uh, class where what is a seizure has traditionally not been a big focus. What's a search gets, you know, day after day after day. Uh, but what's a seizure is a little bit of an afterthought. And now with the way that Torres versus Madrid seems to formalize the doctrine, it's worth sort of, um, you know, teaching like here are the, I think, four different kinds of seizures, seizures of things, seizures of persons with show of authority, seizures by physical force. You, you sort of go through the, the boxes now and probably end up having to sort of teach each of these cases as their own discrete thing. Um, and and there's a, the, there also, I think, are a bunch of great hypotheticals that come out of this. And there's one I wanted to, to ask your thoughts on and also your thoughts of how to teach this as well. If you can kind of combine those two in one, that would be, be awesome. So the, the, the scenario that I find really interesting is um, uh, self-defense use of force where, you know, an officer shoots someone who he thinks has a gun and he claims, I, you know, I, I fired a shot. I, I shot that person thinking they were going to shoot me and I was trying to stop them from shooting me. The person who the officer shoots is injured but not killed uh, and runs away. Was there a seizure under Torres versus Madrid? Uh, and it seems to me it really depends on what this intent to restrain test means. Um, and, you know, is that like, in that case, you could say, well, there was intent to stop the person from shooting. And there was like, a, that would be involve a sort of restraint. Or you could say maybe that implies an intent to kill and that that would have been a restraint. Or you could just say, well, there actually was an intent to apprehend. The, the point of the shooting was not to stop the person as it was in Torres versus Madrid. It was just to keep the officer from being shot. And if that's so, we might be in a very quirky world where the officer firing the shot of the car as it's escaping conducts a seizure, but the officer who shoots the person in the car to stop the person from shooting him has not seized him unless the person stops. Um, what, what do you think of that? Am I, am I running myself in circles about this or is this a real, a real potential problem or how, how, how would you go about solving it? So I, I don't think you're running yourself in circles, right? And I think this is like, you know, this is what we do, right? These are like, you know, the, 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 the hypotheticals to test the next hard question. I'll take your, your, your first question first on just like, how does it influence the teaching? And I think it's, you know, I have a sense that we might well, I'm sure this is true of everybody. Like we might teach our, our crim pro classes a little differently, right? Because I, sure. uh, which I think also maybe based on some of our, our scholarship wouldn't surprise me, right? You know, that um, I'm hearing you say that it's like, you know, uh, a, a search heavy uh, class that you teach, right? Uh, and that makes sense to me because when I'm teaching the search parts, I'm assigning your stuff and talking about all the different, you know, like, um, but, you know, I, I teach a, a very kind of um, like, law of street policing kind of class. Uh, and seizures are just so dominant there, right? Because, because contact, Terry, arrest is like, is, is, is the engine of it all, right? Uh, and even the searches, you know, the searches that are gonna be driving, you know, stop and frisk in New York or something like that, are actually often searches incident to the arrest. So, right? so the seizure actually is, is pretty, is pretty, um, central in the doctrinal story that I'm often trying to teach my students about the practice that we're focused on, which is which is street policing. And as a result, I actually spend a lot of time on Hodari D. Uh, and again, this goes back to where we started. You know, I I kind of took seriously the parts of Hodari D where Justice Scalia just said mere touch is uh, mere touch with intent is a seizure. So in some ways, Torres I have to figure out how I'm going to teach it because in some ways it doesn't add all that much to what I was teaching before because I was tell I was giving them those parts of Hodari D and you know you can imagine me almost treating this as like a little squib where the chief says we we did this in Hodari D what I'm really going to have to figure out is the piece that I told you that's really the potential ring for me is this turning what I was teaching them was a Terry stop into an arrest because if so then the doctrinal implications of that and how I teach seizure is really different and I might sort of be crafting the hypotheticals that try and press on that um, but, you know, so it's it, it's a, a long way of tying back to where I started, which is in some ways when I first heard about this case, I didn't think it was that big a deal because I thought Hodari did it already. And that's the that's the space in my syllabus that it takes. Um, but I think your hypo is a really interesting one. And I think it turns to two um, interrelated, really uh, neat questions, one of which you're, you know, better position to, to talk about than anybody, right? Which is, I think this intent piece is going to start to bear a good bit of weight. Uh, and that, 
a lot of the answers to some of these hypos are good. I think this intent prong that in Hodari D, I didn't get the sense was necessarily doing a ton. And, you know, Justice Scalia put an intent prong in Jones too, right? And, you know, intent is starting to now become potentially more significant for the first question of the Fourth Amendment, like when does it apply? And I think Seth Stoughton has a, ha, has a piece that I have on my list to read. I saw him tweeting about it uh, on exactly the question you get at, you know, the, where it's the shooting and self-defense. There's a whole broad set of circumstances where the police are exerting force not to try to keep someone where they are, but to try to do something else. To me, one of the trickiest is when they're using force to get people to disperse, right? You know, we think back to earlier uh, last year, you know, firing tear gas into a crowd. It's sort of linguistically, you could see some people puzzling over the idea that you are restraining someone by trying to get them to leave, right? Which is what you're doing when you're dispersing, you know, a crowd. And I understand that there's maybe some splits on this of like, well, some folks say exactly that. You're not restraining them if you're trying to get them to disperse. Others say, no, you are restraining them. You're kind of, you know, it's like, a, you know, you're corralling them. You're trying to channel them in certain ways. And that's a restraint on their, on their liberty. You know, I think the same thing could be, I think it's the same type of question that is an open one in your hypothetical, right? One answer is this isn't about restraint at all. This is about self-defense or protection uh, or some intent that is not about um, halting the other person's you know, movement. It's about preventing the other person from shooting at, at, at the officer in your hypothetical. Um, so I guess on some level, it's going to be both a question of what's the intent and what do we actually mean by restrain now, right? You know, is restrain basically constrain their options of what they would do? And if you are constraining them from shooting you, that's a restraint? Or is restraint a narrower, more literal, you know, um, interfere with their ability to move away from you. Uh, and I think that's going to be the next step of where the doctrine has to figure out and might have to figure out, like really lean into if this really does start become the load bearing part of, of this piece of the test under your sort of four buckets, you know? Yeah, that, that was really helpful. And I, I think you're right that the intent to restrain test ends up being sort of, it's it may be the most important doctrinal sort of innovation or at least sort of font of new case law development because the court says it's you know like it's objective determinations of subjective intent and it leaves open flash bang grenades and things which are not sort of tradi traditional ways of apprehending it says we're only dealing with you know intent to restrain here there may be other intents that are also um, seizure so 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 that's one the sort of a loose end that they leave for another day that I think does does uh, have interesting implications and and I Seth's article on is a great one it's basically on how a lot of the the on the street policing doesn't trigger seizures and is not regulated under the fourth it's sort of how much the Fourth Amendment doesn't regulate and what I find so interesting is that I think this is one of those situations where I would guess the majority justices were trying to address Seth's concerns, or at least, you know, implicitly like get to have the Fourth Amendment deal with this. And, and yet they may not have succeeded based on the details of how that, in, at least in, a, in an important fact pattern that's gonna, gonna come up again. We'll see what the lower courts do with it, but. Yeah. Well, cool. Any other, any other thoughts? Uh, thank you so much for, for having me on uh, or, have, or have, being, being on the bonus episode of Legal Academy. A lot of people are probably listening, thinking, or if they're still listening, think, wait a minute, this should be about how you get a teaching job. And this is just about a Supreme Court case. But, but I wanted to harness the, the potential audience that may, may still have the Legal Academy subscribed in their feeds to see if we can get some people to listen to this. Because I think it's a really interesting case. And No, this is great. This, this, is good. This, is the, this, is, this is the first episode of your spinoff podcast series. This makes me uh, excited. <laughs> I, I had thought of doing something like this, and, uh, <laughs> maybe someday, maybe this will be episode one for that. Thanks so much for, for inviting me and great as always to see you and to get to just, uh, yeah, talk Fourth Amendment. Likewise, it was great. Thanks so much. Take care.